dinner or lunch as I did. It's quite delicious. Hope all the mothers got to enjoy some festivity. Like the welcome any guests that we have visiting with us and please if you could uh, fill out the attendance card in the back of the pew and then you can just leave it in the pew when you leave. Uh, for those of you all watching on Facebook, uh, please hit the like button so that we know you are there. If you have a cell phone or other noise making device, please put it on silent or turn it off so that it will not disturb the service. If you have need of a nursery or training room, out the back of the auditorium and to your left, you will find both of them. Our prayer list, uh, we have uh, Brother Zach Matisse's brother's son, Darius, who is in sixth grade, has expressed a desire to commit suicide. Please pray for Darius and his family. Tim Matters, 86-year-old aunt Vivian, is recovering from a fall, and Tim's brother-in-law, Christopher, has cancer. Uh, Buck Chafin is recovering from high blood pressure issues. And uh, Gladys Driver's daughter, Vicki, is recovering from a lumpectomy. She's scheduled to begin chemotherapy in June. Also, Brother Adam Zach is scheduled to have his throat scoped on May 23rd. We do want to congratulate uh, Brother Kingsford and Sister Evelyn Asari on Kingsford's re recent commission to second lieutenant. And he uh, graduated on uh, Friday. And our other announcements, um, oh, that one is already done. Um, if you need your picture taken, please see Brother Pettis or Sister Victoria, and we can set up a, a time to get that done in the library. There is going to be an important ladies' breakfast and work day on Saturday, May 20th at 8.30 a.m. in the fellowship hall. The ladies' day committees will be discussed, followed by a parsonage cleanup. We'll also discuss a June field trip to the Mayborn Planetarium and Space Theater. So please try to make it to all the systems. We have a Youth Devo next Sunday, Sunday, May 21st, following evening worship in the Fellowship Hall. Please bring finger foods. And please put on your calendars. We will be having our 2023 Summer Gospel Meeting, June 25th through June 28th. Our speaker will be Matthew Gibson, a gospel preacher and instructor at the Southwest School of Bible Studies in Austin, Texas. Also, if you are able to help uh, Brother Bill Rawlings with transportation to and from services um, sporadically as needed, please get with Brother Roger D. Are there any other announcements? Those serving this evening, Brother Lee Fisher will have our first prayer. Our song leader will be Brother Gianni Griffith. Our scripture reading will be Jonathan Smith, Brother Jonathan Smith. Our sermon will be by Brother Phil McIntosh. Our communion and offering will be by Brother Ivan McIntosh. And closing prayer will be by Brother Zach. Before we uh, begin our worship service with a prayer, um, Johnny asks, which it makes sense, since we are real light tonight, he asks if everyone could move forward. It would help him tremendously with the singing, right? <laughs> Thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> now we look like we have a, a group of people here tonight. <laughs> yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we again come before thee so thankful for this opportunity you have given us once again to assemble together to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that we put away the things of our life this, at this hour and have our focus on worship at this time. We pray, Father, that we may render all honor and praise to the best of our ability to you. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you, Father, for Jesus and that he died on Calvary's cross and shed his blood, Father, that we can have remission of sins and one day have a home with thee in heaven. Put your mind of uh, those that Galen has mentioned that are continue to have difficulties with health. We ask, Father, healing. We ask that blessings to be with them and strengthen them in their bodies that they may be restored. But we also uh, are mindful of the congregation here at WS Young. We pray for us, Father, as, as a body. We ask, Father, that, that you may help us, Father, always in the things that we endeavor to do. Galen also has mentioned, Father, that we have a number of things coming up, a gospel meeting and various other things. And we realize, Father, that anything that we do, we cannot do it unless you are there with us. And we ask always for help. Continue to bless us, Father, bless our families, uh, help us, Father, as parents, to be able to always guide our children with your way. Help us, Father, to be able to impart to our children who are the next generation, Father, the scriptures concerning your word, Father, the one church, Father, and to be able to help that they may one day take their place, Father, in their families and teach their children the same. Thank you, Father, for the gospel. Thank you that is able to save many souls. Help us, Father, as uh, members here, Father, to be able to Tell others, Father, about Jesus. Tell others about the plan of salvation. Tell others about you, your saving grace. Now, Father, we are thankful for this day, and we thank thankful we had opportunity to be with our families and celebrate Mother's Day. And again, Father, we are so thankful for our mothers and the love that they, they have shown us. Now, as we continue in our service this hour, be with us, Father, and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Start off, we'll be singing Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah, verses 1 and 3. You ready? Let us sing. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the heart. All his angels. All the souls together. Praise Stars on high, praise and glory to the sky. Let them pray. Still, Jehovah, his name is hard. And this glory is exalted, and this glory is exalted, and this glory is exalted, and sky. All ye birds in the trees and cedars, all ye birds in Mountains are creeping, sank, 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 
Good evening. I'll be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verses 25 and 40. How terrible it will be for you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! Clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but on the inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that its outside may be clean. How terrible it will be for you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead people's bones and every kind of impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you look righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I'm not ashamed to owe my Lord to be singing all three verses. If you're ready, let us sing. I'm not ashamed to owe my Lord to maintain the honors of this world. The glory of his cross. Burn mass is thrown on him in his promise and he can set secure one to his till the decisive bow. There will be only one who works his name before his father's face. And the new job is a good morning. Our invitation song will be singing 348 Jesus is in the song. Good evening. Oh, our bodies move down front, but our voices do. Good evening. Here we go. Those of you in Bible class this morning have a little bit of a preview on what we were going to discuss tonight because we, we mentioned it, talked about a king. We talked a little bit, only very briefly, about the, the contents uh, of our lesson this evening. The title of our lesson is Jehoram's Play. I want to talk about some dangers that exist in our world just a couple of minutes. We have various threats, fears, anxieties, and dangers to us that exist in our world. Our dangers range from anything to atmospheric, to communal, those people around us. They range from things that are dangers of a seismic nature and dangers of, as so many of us have seen over the last handful of years play out, can absolutely throw a wrench into the inner workings of everything we know 
we live under the threat of dangers of an infectious nature. All of these things, I don't know how much you've thought about this, but you think about disease, violence, hatred, even the dangers that exist that are atmospheric, meteorological, and seismic. All of these are still man-made catastrophes. They're still man-made problems because God created us good. God created everything good. God created man in a, a haven and man decided to corrupt it. As a result, over the course of time, all of these other types of things began. Now, so many times when we have tornadoes or hurricanes, tsunamis or other things like that happen we we talk about the the nature that exists around us people may talk about mother nature and however it is that they would like to describe that they they talk about catastrophes that that come from god yeah. it is my belief and understanding based on what we see in the bible that these things did not exist in our world until god altered the very livelihoods in which we lived in the great flood that was a direct result of mankind's rampant wickedness. Then life shortened. Hurricanes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and on and on we could go about the dangers that came, and yes, including disease. You and I are very familiar with disease. We may have had it impact us. We may have had it impact someone we know. We might have even had various diseases impact someone that we love. Some diseases have been around for a long time. Some of them may have grown or shrunk as to their, not power, but their presence among the, the realm of mankind, maybe more active in certain parts of the world than others, but there's still some diseases that have been around a long time that are likely, as long as this world spins, never going to go anywhere. Some of the most ancient diseases, things like tuberculosis, cholera, typhoid, on and on we could go. Surely you are familiar with them. Plagues, since that's the title of our lesson tonight, that have existed in our world. The Spanish flu of the 20th century, the Black Death of the 14th century. I've got an interesting nugget, if you're curious, about the Spanish flu of the 20th century. It was an avian flu that, to the best of someone's understanding, likely began, just think to yourself for a minute, where? What part of the world do you think the Spanish flu originated from? It likely came from Kansas. And we think Spain because it's the Spanish flu, but that's not really the history of the Spanish flu. But these things have plagued our world and have killed millions upon millions of people. Now, some of these diseases certainly are, are, are still in our presence today. Sometimes we still feel the effects of them. But if you could think about one of the diseases or infections or plagues that seems to affect people we know frequently, that seems to surround us in our world, perhaps it is at a disproportionate rate even in our country as compared to others. One of the most fear-inspiring words in the lives in which you and I live in the scheme of the existence of mankind is cancer. We have seen so many people suffer because of cancer. Lives cut short because of cancer. Old men, old women, young boys and young girls. Cancer is an equal opportunity aggressor. Some of, us, some of us have had closer looks at that than others. 
Some of us have had more intimate experience with cancer than others. That's not necessarily the topic for us to discuss tonight, but I wanted to begin with that because it is the belief, at least by some, I say some because of the, the place where I found this information, at least by one medical doctor, that there is a possibility of the existence of cancer talked about in the Bible. Now, how old is it? It's believed that the first evidence of cancer in our world extends back to about 3000 BC. Now, cancer is something that is aggressive today. That It seems like so many times people talk about things they have found out at their doctor and they go for a biopsy and they get information that is negative to them. We, we have some, some aggressive treatments for cancer. Sometimes they are incredibly effective. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes it has progressed to a stage beyond correction. But cancer is not a, a new problem in our world. If it is accurate that cancer has its roots in history going back to 3000 BC, that means cancer has been in our world for over 5,000 years. So it certainly could be possible that the text we're going to look at tonight could include some points of what might lead us to a, a diagnosis of cancer. But let me make this clear. If the text we're going to read tonight is biblical evidence of cancer, if the individual we're going to read about tonight suffered from the effects of cancer, it still was not the worst thing in their life. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 21. We begin talking about the history. These first three are all going to be something related to this king, and his name is Jehoram, if you're taking notes. J-E-H-O-R-A-M. First, we'll look at the history of Jehoram. It can be a little bit confusing, and if you're going to search online to try to find where in the Bible this individual is talked about, you need to exercise a little bit of caution, because guess what? There's more than one Jehoram. And to make matters worse for our confusion, they existed at about the same time. One of them was king of Israel. One of them was king of Judah. One of them was a son of Ahab. One of them was a son of Jehoshaphat. Let me turn over to 2 Chronicles so I can be where you are, and we'll read together. We are concerned in our study tonight with King Jehoram that was the son of Jehoshaphat. Perhaps you remember over the last couple of months, we have referenced it, if not once or twice. I believe we had at least uh, one specific reference where we had a sermon that was uh, focused on that particular activity. Remember the man, Micaiah? who was called before King Ahab. King Ahab was looking for someone to help him in his fight. So he called the king of Judah, which was King Jehoshaphat, to come up to him. We find out in that text that these two men were related. They're going to go into battle together. And it was King Jehoshaphat that says, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire? King Ahab wasn't concerned about asking God what he should do because Ahab did not respect God. Ahab did not revere God. But King Jehoshaphat said, is there, is there not somebody that can bring us the, the word of the Lord, whether or not we should go? It was that man's son that we're concerned with tonight. Second Chronicles 21, start reading with me in verse 1. And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariahu, Michael, and Shephashah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram. Because he was the firstborn. Notice what that text does not say. That text does not say he awarded the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the best option. That text does not say he awarded the kingdom to Jehoram because he deserved it. 
The text does not say that he awarded the kingdom to Jehoram because he was going to be a good and godly king because he could not have been any further from such. He simply was awarded the kingdom because he was the oldest. And that's simply how those things usually worked. King Jehoram was the great, great, great grandson of King Solomon. He ruled in the generally more conservative southern kingdom. And the Bible tells us that he reigned for eight years, from the years, approximately from the years 848 to 841. So if you're thinking about where this fits in between the time of Isaiah in 739 or 740, the time of Solomon in the 960s to 920s, we are right there somewhere in the middle. What we find as we continue looking about this king is that his reign was stained with ungodliness, partially because of who he decided to marry. Now, that's not the point of our lesson tonight, but it's certainly a, uh, an application we could make. Verse 6 says that he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done, for he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, it's not Ahab's problem. It's not his fault that Jehoram was evil. It's, it's not necessarily because he made this decision to marry this individual that he just wound up evil. He clearly does not have a, a good heart from the beginning of what we read about this individual. We'll find out more about that in just a moment. But there is some foolishness in the decision making. Because if you note that the Bible says he married the daughter of Ahab, well, that's not all that she was, because he also married the daughter of Jezebel. And when you look in the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 31 and 32, it was Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, who actually introduced Baal worship into the household of Ahab. It certainly then is no stretch to see the connection between Jezebel and now her daughter being married into this family of King Jehoram. If you have spent time recently reading through your Old Testament, or maybe if you just remember this name, if you want to know what kind of influence this woman had on King Jehoram, Learn her name. Most of you who have read your scriptures, who are familiar with the Old Testament, you know the kind of reputation this woman had. You know what kind of person this woman was. Jehoram's wife, Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, was named Athaliah. You do any kind of reading the Old Testament, you can see, you certainly know very quickly what kind of woman Jehoram had chosen for wife. Turn with me if you would. Let's sum up this first point, talking about the history of King Jehoram by going back to the book of 2 Kings and going to chapter number 8. 2 Kings chapter number 8. When you get there, I want you to just read with me, starting in verse 16. Now, in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, having been king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, began to reign as king of Judah. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David as he had promised to give a lamp to him and his sons forever. We'll come back and mention a little bit later what we see there in verse 19. Now, we've already read enough about his history to know that he was an ungodly king. We already have read enough about his history to know that he, he made unwise decisions certainly affected by the wife of his choosing. Now, as I mentioned, this point of our lesson tonight 
is not to speak to those who are unmarried and tell them to be careful who they marry, but we can make 30 seconds of application to that if nobody minds. So many times in the past, people have talked about, well, I am a member of the church and there's this person who's not a member of the church and I love them and I want to be with them and, and I will convert them. And that is certainly a great goal to have, but more often than not, it happens the other way around. The non-Christian deconverts. I know that's not, that's, that's not a real word, but you know what I mean by that. The one who is a Christian, they leave the faith and now you've got two non-Christians. It is important, the individuals that we choose to date. It is important, the individuals with whom we choose to spend our time. And it can be, it can potentially be eternally damaging to marry someone, to hitch your wagon to someone for the rest of your life who has not hitched their wagon to God. It's just not a wise decision to make. Surely Athaliah had negatively affected King Jehoram. You would assume someone that was the son of Jehoshaphat might be a little bit more godly, but that's not the picture that the Bible paints of this king. It certainly did him no favors that he was married to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So we progress on. If you want to go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 21, we've talked a little bit about the history of King Jehoram. But we're not necessarily here for just his history. We're here for his sin. And what happens beyond that? I told you that his reign was stained, stained, marred, corrupted, disfigured. Any words you want to use and any strength of word you want to use is probably appropriate to use. Because he was a holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, ungodly person. Did not care for God, did not care for God's laws, did not listen to hardly, according to what the Bible tells us, anything that God had to say. King Jehoram did what he wanted, how he wanted, when he wanted, with no care. So wicked was this individual that the prophet Elijah even wrote him a letter attempting to impact him in some way or warn him of what was happening in his life. Go with me, if you would, to the text in 2 Chronicles chapter 21. Let's start reading in verse 11, I'm verse 4, I'm sorry, and go to verse 11. Now, when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. As we already read verse six, and he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab, he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. In his days, Edom revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. So Jehoram went out with his officers and all his chariots with him. And he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots. Thus Edom has been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day. At that time, Libna revolted against his rule because he had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit harlotry and led Judah astray. As you read through the text, there is not very much other than he was son of a, a well-known king. Not very much you can say good about King Jehoram. Not very many feathers he could put in his cap because he was a diseased individual. I told you that Elijah wrote him a letter. Look at verse 12. And a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet saying, Thus says the Lord God of your father David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat your father or in the ways of Asa, the king of Judah, which was his grandfather, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel. And have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot, like the harlotry of the house of Ahab. And also have killed your brother. Those of your father's household, pay attention to this, who were better than yourself. I told you he didn't get the kingship because he deserved it. God, through the prophet Elijah, tells him here, you are the worst son your father had. That's a pretty powerful thing to say, is it not? 
And we know as parents, we're not supposed to, to play favorites, right? We say, well, I love all of my kids equally. Well, Jehoshaphat may have loved all of his kids equally, and he may have assumed various value to each one of those kids, uh, but God just told Jehoram he was the worst one his dad had. You're the worst person of your family. We noticed that the first thing he did when he became king is kill all of his family. First thing he did was kill his brothers. That was only the beginning of his wickedness. Verse 14 says, Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction, your children, your wives, and all your possessions. And you will become very sick with a disease of your intestines till your intestines come out by reason of the sickness day by day. This is not a pretty text to read. As you look at what happens, you look at all of the sin there that exists in King Jehoram's life. The murder. The loss of power because of his sinfulness. His building of high places, of, of offering worship to fake gods. Of bringing other people along with his spiritual adultery. Making them play the harlot before God. Irresponsibly leading God's people into a direction that will cause them harm. And yet for all of the things that were wrong for King Jehoram at that time that he received the letter, his life was about to get worse. Because Elijah mentioned that something was going to happen to him. Elijah mentioned something would happen to the nation. But Elijah mentioned specifically in verse 15 that something was going to happen to the king himself. This is not a metaphor. This is not symbolic. This is not an allegory. Elijah mentions that something literal and physical is going to happen to King Jehoram. He is going to be the recipient of a plague. So our third point, let's talk about the plague. As you look through the Bible, you notice sometimes that you see changes. The Bible tells us that oftentimes in ancient days, God would react quickly to sin. God would punish sometimes immediately with sin. Think about Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1, 2, and 3. How quickly did they, Dab and Abihu, find themselves struck down and incinerated because of their sin before God when they offered unauthorized fire? Think about what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about what even happened to King David. Oftentimes, punishment was immediate, or at least it came very quickly. But God doesn't necessarily work in the world that way anymore. The Bible tells us that God's judgment will come at the end when we stand before God, when the book of our life is open, when God's book is open, and when we are judged by the Lord Jesus. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, We will give an account of the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Well, we're in the ancient days, as we read in 2 Chronicles, so it is not a punishment that's going to be put off until judgment day. Oh, I'm sure that he will stand before God in judgment. But there's a punishment before that day. There is a judgment before that day, something that was going to happen to him there in that moment. God there proclaimed and dictated a plague that would come upon this man. Look at verses 18 and 19. After all this, the Lord struck him in his intestines with an incurable disease. Then it happened in the course of time, after the end of two years, that his intestines came out because of his sickness. So he died in severe pain. His people made no burning for him like the burning for his fathers. Now, I cannot tell you for sure. Only God can. Only God knows for sure what really happened to King Jehoram. But I read an article where I read an abstract of an article recently. I didn't read the entire article. I read an abstract of an article. And I thought this was interesting. Sometimes online, you have to be careful where you find information. Uh, you, you realize that these days, anybody can make a blog. Anybody can make a website. 
Anybody can put any information out there that they like, and they can make it look very official. They can make it look very real, and they can make it look very believable. One of the largest names we have that is familiar to all of us as we search information on the internet is Wikipedia. I came across an article recently, I don't remember where I saw this, but essentially it said that Wikipedia was accurate uh, between 80 and 85 or so percent of the time. Well, that's not a terrible average. I mean, if you, if you and I were right 85% of the time, that'd be pretty good, but you certainly don't want to make a medical diagnosis or financially plan for your life or raise your children based on an 85% success rate of Wikipedia. You have to be careful the information you find online. That being said, this abstract I read of this article where a medical doctor, at least it was referencing a medical doctor's opinion as to what's happening here in 2 Chronicles 21 was found at NIH.gov. It was an abstract of an article that we, that we actually came from our country's National Institute of Health. It was an interesting source to find this kind of a conversation. And what the abstract of that article said, or the, the section of that article that I, I was able to read, is that in a modern medical doctor's opinion, conclusion, what we read here in Second Chronicle chapter 21 could be one of the earliest examples of a certain type. I will not mention the name. It's, it's just simply not a pretty name. But the earliest examples of a certain type of carcinoma. In a modern medical doctor's opinion, Jehoram could have possibly died of cancer. Now, I don't know that that's exactly what the text is saying. We do know that the Bible says he was struck with a disease and that in two years he died. And as you read the, the activity there that's mentioned, it is, it, it's a horribly unpleasant thing to read. Because as I mentioned, there, there's no indications anywhere that this is symbolic or, 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 or allegorical. What the Bible is saying is that this man was struck with an uncurable disease, and whatever it was that disease was caused him that quite literally, and I realize this is unpalatable to hear, but quite literally, his insides came out until he died. What a horrible way to die. Bible says he died in great pain. So the question is, what can you and I take from the example of the life of a king that lived some almost 2,900 years ago? Well, one of the first things I want to do before we really start to dig into what we can see here in the text is to finish this section I want you to see what kind of reputation Jehoram had among his peers. And then we want to talk before we mention an application about God's mercy, God's grace, and God's faithfulness. But before we get there, I want you to note verse 20. What you find when you read about this king, you know, there are some, some people in this world who have done some pretty horrible things, some detestable things, some unconscionable things. And yet you've still got some people that defend them. You've still got some people that love them. You've still got some people that, that respect them and that, that show some care or compassion for them. What we find out when we read 2 Chronicles chapter 21 in verse 20 is that King Jehoram died and he was highly respected and loved by nobody. The text says he was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and to no one's sorrow departed. However, they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. The Bible tells us that not one single soul missed him. Not one single person was sorry when he died. Think about how terrible a person has to be that not one single person cared when he died. And this is supposed to be the southern kingdom where they're supposed to be godly. Well, as I mentioned earlier, they were generally more conservative, generally more godly, but that clearly wasn't the case with King Jehoram. So before we jump into that final application of what we can take away from the text, I want you to think about God's grace, mercy, and his faithfulness. It was mentioned in 2 Kings 8. 
verse 19, I believe. It was mentioned here in 2 Chronicles 21. Uh, you go back and look in verse 7. That God could have, but did not. Well, what could have? Well, God's anger was kindled, clearly. God was angry enough with Jehoram and how he was living and how he had led God's people astray that he afflicted him personally with a disease. But God did not take his fingers and snuff out that flame. God could have ended the line of David right then. God had every right because of man's sinfulness to stop that line right there. Remember what God told Moses? A long time ago, God tells Moses, I can just get rid of them and I can start a new people. God has the power to do anything he wants. We saw what he did in the great flood, how the Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives are the only people out of the hundreds of thousands or likely millions of people who populated the earth at that point, only eight survived. God could have snuffed out the flame of the candle of David. He could have cut that wick and made that family go dark, but he didn't do it. Why? Because of God's plan, because of God's mercy, because of God's long suffering, and because the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, he is faithful who promises. Now, God had promised Abraham that from him and from his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. We know that to be a messianic reference. Can you imagine? As wicked as this king was, can you imagine another place in the Bible where his name is found? Matthew chapter 1 and verse 8 in the lineage of Jesus. God didn't snuff out that line of David because it was going to continue. Jehoshaphat, Asa, his father and grandfather, and Jehoram himself are listed in the Messianic genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 because God was faithful. Because of God's mercy, because of God's grace, because it says he had made a covenant with David and had promised to give him a lamp to him and his sons forever. Because of the promise of Jesus, God did not stop that family that day. God did not cut off that line. An incredibly wicked man, Jehoram was. But God allowed that line to continue because he knew his son was going to be sent from that line. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier, th this is not a pleasant text to read. It's not pleasant to imagine what might have happened to King Jehoram. We don't know all of the details, but we do know that he died very quickly, and he died in severe pain, and he died as a result of his wickedness. Here's the point, and I hope you've already got this. I hope you've already put two and two together. I hope you put two and two together a long time ago when you first heard the scripture read. Jehoram was an incredibly wicked man. He had not a shred of consideration for God. And so he was pronounced that he would receive a plague. But you know, that wasn't the worst plague that Jehoram had in his body. Jehoram was plagued, all right. But Jehoram was plagued before God plagued him. Jehoram was plagued because what was coming out, what kind of disease God had afflicted him with, was only a mirror of the heart that he had inside of him. Jehoram was already plagued because he had a, a dark, unkind, ungodly, wicked heart. So as nasty as we see this text is and how this man died, it's only a reflection of who he was inside it's a reflection of the kind of mind and heart that he had to begin with. I can't help but think about the words of Jesus. Turn with me to the book of Matthew. And we start in chapter 15. Just look at two references with me here in the book of Matthew. Matthew 15, beginning in verse 16. Jesus taught a parable. Peter asked him to explain it. So in verse 16, Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? 
But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. What we read of King Jehoram in 2 Kings 8 and 2 Chronicles 21, what defiled him was not the physical plague. What defiled him was the spiritual plague. What defiled him was how ungodly his heart was. What defiled him was how unrestrainedly wicked he was as a person. That was the true plague of King Jehoram. Now turn over with me to our scripture reading tonight, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, as Jesus stands there in the sight of all of those Pharisees who had so frequently chastised him and chased him. And he gives them pronouncement as he looks beyond what a normal man can see. As Jesus peers, not at their outside, but at their inside. Look at verse 25. What are you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The details in 2 Chronicles chapter 21 about the kind of plague that King Jehoram received from God and died from. That plague was not as damaging. Was not as painful. And was not as disgusting as the plague he had inside already. Simply because he didn't love God. He didn't care for God. And so our point is, what can we possibly take from this? Well, it's an easy application, especially when you've already read Matthew 15 and Matthew 23. It's an easy application. This is one of the great things that God has done for us, how God can give us an example of an ancient king who lived almost 3,000 years ago, who died from possibly an incredibly painful form of cancer. And yet we can, in the year 2023, make perfect application to it. And that is this. As we continue to live our lives, we can focus on the outside. We can focus on the suits and the dresses and the, and the, the makeup and the haircuts and the jewelry and the, uh, the watches and the shoes and the vehicles. We can invest our time and ensure that we are, are looking good. We can even make sure that we are investing time so that, that we are physically fit and we are the best examples of ourselves outside for others to see. And there's nothing wrong with caring for our outsides, caring for, modifying, producing a good result for what people see on the outside. But if we're trying to make our lives right with God, our focus should not be on how am I dressing up the outside. My focus should be, am I dressing up the inside? It doesn't matter how sweet I smell on the outside if my inside is decayed. It doesn't matter how expensive your cologne or your perfume is and people walk by and they just can't help but comment on how great you smell or how great you look. That does not matter if your inside is crumbling and decaying and is shriveling because of spiritual cancer. Jesus said it's the inside that defiles. And it's the inside that was dead men's bones. Jesus told the Pharisees, I'm going to sum up and paraphrase what Jesus said. Jesus told the Pharisees, it doesn't really matter what your outside looks like, it's your inside. You and I have charge over our inside. There's actually only so much of our outsides that we can control. You don't like your nose, your hair, your eyes. Well, tough. That's the way you're made. We have what we have, whether you like what you look in the mirror or you don't. And if you don't like what you see in the mirror, stop looking in the mirror. That's about the only, that's the only option I've got for you. Unless you want to spend five, six, seven thousand dollars in plastic surgery. 
Uh, if you think it's a wise use of God's money uh, that he's blessed you with, that's another conversation for you to decide. The point is, we can't always control what our outside looks like. We can always control what our inside looks like. We can always control what we put in, how much of it we put in, and we can control what we keep out. If you let cancerous things into your soul, cancerous things are going to come out of your soul. If you let worldly things into your mind, worldly things are going to come out of your mind. If we let ungodly things into our insides, ungodly things are going to come out. Yes, Jehoram was afflicted and died from a horrible plague. But that wasn't the worst plague of his life. You and I have the power over our lives today to ensure that our insides never have that plague. You and I have the power over our life to listen to God's word and to listen to it, to obey it. If maybe for the first time, if you have not tonight accepted the gift that God has provided to you by faith and obedience, you have that opportunity to hear God's word and believe it, to repent of your sins, to confess Jesus' identity as the Christ, the Son of God and the Savior. And to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, rising to walk in newness of life. At that point, being made bright and new and clean, a new creation in Christ. At that moment, your inside is sparkling. If you've not taken that opportunity, do that tonight. But if you have already done that, at one point, your insides are sparkling. At what point, your inside was new. At one point, your inside was perfectly clean. But what does it look like now? As we talked about this morning, just because salvation comes to the individual does not mean salvation stays with the individual. We have to work to keep our inside clean. We have to work to keep the dead men's bones out of there and to hold on to the godly treasures that the Bible has given us. You and I may die from some terrible things. We could die from COVID. We could die from cancer. We could be stabbed, shot on the side of the road. We could die in a car wreck. We could die of some new painful disease we've never even heard of yet. But let's make sure whatever happens to our outsides, nothing grotesque ever happens to our insides. Because as long as our insides are clean, as long as our insides are godly, as long as our insides are holy, this body will fall off one day. We'll be replaced with a whole new body one day. And if our insides are pleasing to God, if our minds, hearts, and souls are pleasing to God, then we'll be given access into that eternal home with him and his son. Matthew chapter 25 and 21 says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou in into the joy of thy Lord. That's the goal we're shooting for. Ensure that the inside is as clean as the inside can get. We may die from some other kind of plague, but you and I have the control and the power to ensure that our insides never die from a spiritual plague. Whatever the need may be tonight, if you are amenable to God's law, if you are subject to the invitation, we invite you to come over stand and sing. Why from the sunshine of love Jesus is bleeding, he goes to his heart. Then you put me on this day, shall be told. Make me a rising away.
prepare our minds for communion. We're singing, often we come together. Three, sixteen. Three, nine, three. Be thinking all three verses. You're right. Let us sing. Oft we come together, oft we sing and pray. Here we are all three on this holy day. Uh, 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 If you did not get a chance to partake of the Lord's Supper, please raise your hand. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to your presence this evening once again. And then we're coming to give a token of what you are blessed with us. Father Lord, we pray that may this offering be acceptable unto you. And then may you continue to guide us and provide for us so that we will continue to come here to be able to give into your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing song? Be singing Sanctuary. Let us sing.
Our Father in heaven, we are thankful again, that you gave us the ability and the strength to come and assemble ourselves to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that I know we came for the right reason. We pray we didn't come for a show nor an act. Way that we have worshipped. See her. Oh, we believe the most thing to come and worship. We will pray, Father, for those that neglect, that don't have a desire. Lord, that their minds may be changed. For that which is an error to that which is right. And thank you, Father, for you. That you presented unto us. That we was able and we prayed that it May use it within our life, Father. It's displeasing. Now, Father, as we now completely that we do this distance ourselves and the court from this building, we ask thy will that you allow us. Vice President, and those that are leading positions to pray for the bodies of Christ. Increasing our faith and staying rooted and grounded in the truth that we are unmovable. To be an example unto this world, sitting up on the hill. We pray, Father, that you will please this congregation.
that we do all things pleasing, acceptable, and acceptable. Thank you again, Father. Thanks, Father, in thy son Jesus Christ's name, whom we love. Amen.